Welcome back to our growing experiment. We're here with Erin and Stefan from Truly Northern Farms. Now, do you guys want to tell us a little bit about yourselves? Sure. Uh, so Truly Northern was launched uh, about four or five years ago when uh, we moved back from South Korea and decided to try something different and basically um, launch a hydroponic farm in the suburb area. So we bought uh, kind of two shipping container style farming units uh, without really knowing very much about no, farming. Knowing nothing, really. Yeah, or, or <laughs> hydroponics or marketing or any of that stuff. Um, and kind of both of us launched into it full time uh, with the idea that we could do something that was home-based, uh, community-driven, and kind of uh, rewarding and challenging um, I, I wanted to do something that I was going to be interested in for the next, you know, couple of decades, something that I could work into a <laughs> yeah. career and farming uh, quickly. I realized that that was good for me because it's ever changing. It's, it's not consistent in that, you know, there's always new challenges to overcome. And so, yeah, we've been kind of making a go at it for the last um, four or five years now, maybe even six years. And um, two and a half years ago, we launched a new facility near Capus Casing in a small town called Opisatica and uh, kind of went about designing uh, a system from the ground up for that facility, knowing that I wasn't going to be living up there full time. Uh, so I knew what worked and what didn't work from our first system in Sudbury. And so since then, our production has really skyrocketed. We went from, you know, growing a couple hundred pounds of kale to now growing uh, you know, four, five, six hundred pounds a week of lettuce, um, basil, kale, and other herbs. And it's been uh, a huge uh, whirlwind. It's been fun. It's been challenging. It's, it's, you know, it's been a whole lot of things. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's been interesting. And mostly positive, I would yeah. say, like our, yeah. our experience has been really positive, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah, so we love what we do. Yeah, so what were you guys doing in Korea before you come back to start doing this? Uh, we were teaching. Um, Steph went there, I believe, in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, I arrived in 2008, and we just kind of crossed paths. But I, I started teaching at a kindergarten, uh, English, and Steph uh, was teaching in a university. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and then we both got university jobs, which are kind of coveted in Korea because you get um, four months of vacation. Uh, they pay for your housing. Like it, it's a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but we, we had been doing that for like 10 years and it was time to come back to Canada, you know? So we started researching a lot of different industries that we'd be interested in getting into. We both knew that we were kind of done with teaching at that time. Uh, and farming was just it. Like we discussed a whole bunch of different ones. And when Steph came across this container farm idea, it was like, yes, that, that is it. That's the path. You know, there was mm -hmm. pretty much at that point we dove in. Yeah. So with the, the container setup that you first started with, so there was a company, I guess, that sort of has like a, an out of the box, almost ready to go get going farming sort of thing. And that's what you yeah. guys started with. Yeah. Yeah. So we got involved with a company called Modular Farm, who is no longer in business, um, unfortunately. And uh, when we when we kind of bought into the idea, we actually received one of the first four farms that they ever built. We actually uh, I think we were the first kind of container farm to be legally placed on non-agricultural land. So zoned um, basically with all the paperwork and everything, the inspections. So it was kind of a big moment. Um, there are new companies that have popped up in Canada and in the States since then. Um, but what we realized about container farming is that it's got a, a little bit of a limited application um, and it doesn't really play all that well for wholesale markets. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah. the scale and the variabilities of growing, trying to grow a lot of food in a small space like that um, poses a lot of issues in terms of consistency of production. And so we quickly realized that on a smaller scale, these farms were great, um, you know, direct to market, direct to consumer, no problem. But if we're ever wanting to move away from having to um, do farmers markets or find more farmers markets and more retail avenues uh, by getting more farms, that it wasn't going to work. And so that's where we kind of took a step back from the container farms 
and and went with a different approach in in Opisatica. Mm -hmm. And so what was it that you changed or what was it that you really learned was uh, the, the main thing that you needed to change? Like what was the what was the big change in, uh, in your new in your new place? Yeah, so um, the container farm industry, for the most part, relies on either towers, which are kind of vertical farming in the true sense that the plants are actually vertically on the wall. Um, that in itself poses a lot of issues because water irrigation, it poses a lot of issues for irrigation, ultimately. Yeah, um, there's a lot of mechanical pumps, you know, yeah. and, and mechanics fail. <laughs> and sometimes you catch it and sometimes you don't. And yeah. sometimes you wake up and your whole farm's dead. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you know? with the gravity playing against you all the time, um, when your pumps do fail, if there is an issue with irrigation, then you're um, really having to catch it really early on. And it also, even if it doesn't fail, but it just doesn't work as good as it, as it should be in an optimal level, then your yields really suffer. And it's tough to find that out until, you know, harvest day. Um, and you're like, oh, our production's down 30% this week. I wonder why. And it's like, oh, wait, one of our lines was slightly clogged. So the back end of the whole wall wasn't getting enough water and stuff like that. Um, the, so that, for the, for the most part, was kind of the biggest issue. Um, the, also, the yields, what was promised. And a lot of these technology companies, they're first and foremost uh, salespeople, right? They have a product that they're designed they're mostly over engineered and they're not for the most part driven by farmers. Uh, these people are, you know, again, and I say people, but most of these companies are again, are engineer driven, not farmer driven. Mm -hmm. So what they promise you, you're going to make this much money and you're going to grow it's this, this amount of hours of work. A yeah, week. exactly. <laughs> it's all theoretical. And you, and what happens is that the, the, the numbers they give you quickly go right out the window. Um, and so you're having to kind of struggle and, and problem solve, problem solve to try to get your yields up and it, it ends up being a lot of work. Um, and so the difference is that with, um, Opisatica, I needed to have my irrigation solution be more consistent. So we went with a stacked horizontal approach. So we're still farming vertically, but the plants are, uh, ultimately living the way that they're living outside. Right, the sun is up, uh, and and the roots are down. Um, with that, it opens the the floor to a lot of technology that is existing already. Like uh, in California, they've been floating lettuce on rafts for decades now. Mm -hmm. um, we've been growing high, you know, strawberries hydroponically for decades now. Mm -hmm. So, um, our system is designed in that fashion, and so it makes it a lot easier to train staff. It, it improves our operating efficiencies quite a bit because it's just you're cutting lettuce like you're normally meant to. You're just cutting it 12 feet up in the air. Um, and so that's been a huge uh, advantage. Also, by doing it ourselves, um, I was able to kind of source all of my lighting directly from China, which is where everybody's buying their lighting anyways. But you're cutting a lot. I was able to cut out a lot of the middle people, the middle companies. Yeah. Um, and so the cost of setting up was a lot cheaper, like 75% a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah really there's a huge, yeah. well, the, the hydroponic industry now is becoming way more mainstream. Now it's almost a little bit everywhere. And so hydroponic doesn't have the same connotation it did five years ago. Five years ago, we think hydroponics, you think marijuana, and then there's that marijuana price tag. Mm -hmm. right so million they, dollar farms they knew yeah. that you're going to be in and if you're growing a crop that sells for a hundred dollars an ounce they can justify the two thousand dollar light yeah. but when you're growing a lettuce that's <laughs> 80 cents an ounce 60 cents an ounce then the the math doesn't work as good right yeah. Yeah. so with uh with hydroponics is there any sort of limitations to what you can grow mm, root Ish? Yes and no in that, and people ask me this all the time. Um, yes, there are some limitations because hydroponics, you think you're taking the soil away. The soil for the most part, and traditional farmers are going to roast me for this, but, <laughs> and yes, there's all sorts of goodness in there and, and microbiology and organisms that's super important, but ultimately the, the soil offers support for the root system. Um, and so tubers 
uh, carrots, potatoes, anything that is using the soil more than the leafy part of the plant is poses a bit more of a problem, but we have people growing radishes hydroponically, no problem. Pumpkins. Um, pumpkins <laughs> and stuff. So you can grow pretty much a lot of stuff, maybe even all, arguably everything hydroponically, but what you can do and what you can do commercially are two different things. Right. And so I can, we can try all sorts of stuff, but, and it'll grow whether or not it can make money to pay for the lights. And ultimately hydroelectricity is your biggest operating expense. So you're mm -hmm. always trying to weigh off. I'm um, shining lights like strawberries, for example, it's a little trickier. You've got to basically, you know, light them for two to three months before you even get your first crop. Yeah. Well, if you've got crop failure at three months or your strawberry yields aren't as good as you thought they were, well, that's a big hydro bill that you've yeah. expended. Yeah. Yeah, that's energy spent that you're not going to get back. And yeah, it, mu it must be then that um, like lettuce and the microgreens and all that kind of stuff. That's probably like uh, the best bet, I guess, then, right? Yeah, for sure. So quick turnaround crops like lettuce, leafy greens um, are absolutely the the go to for hydroponic farming operations and technologies. Um, it's a no brainer. Um, it's definitely been tried and, and proven to be commercially viable. Um, and now we're starting to see a lot more money being dumped. And, and all of this stuff is going to happen. It's just who are the first pioneers to test it out and take that gamble. But we're going to see things like strawberries. And we have seen strawberries uh, already hydroponically, but like fully indoor strawberries. I think in the next year, two, five years, we're going to see more operations launching something vertically farming. Uh, and there's going to be all sorts of different crops that come up, but those companies that invest in that R&D, it's definitely a risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is something I've been hearing a lot of too. Like we, we hear a lot of people in the sort of permaculture, sort of uh, natural farming kind of way, but I mm -hmm. also have been hearing a lot about vertical farming and indoor farming and doing exactly what you guys are doing. And I think what I've heard too, is there is a, a big growing market there and getting it at mm -hmm. the ground floor mm -hmm. is, is big. So uh, when you, when you start getting bigger and bigger, so the, the idea is just, you keep kind of keep, you probably make your model that you have and just sort of make it bigger, more surface area kind of thing, or more square footage and then stack and stack and stack. Yeah. There is, um, an issue with stacking too, though, because indoor farming, like again, with our shipping containers, the issue with our shipping containers is that, um, you can try to cram as many plants as you want in there to try to make it more profitable, but you can only fit so many plants per cubic feet of air and plants sweat, mm -hmm. right? And so humidity and temperature management, um, if you're going 25 feet high, your temperature and humidity at zero and your temperature and humidity at 20 feet in the air are gonna be drastically different. So you're having to invest in better air conditioning, air exchangers, dehumidification, which all has a huge cost. Yeah. Um, air conditioning for the most part is about 30% of our hydroelectricity usage in a traditional vertical farm. Um, so we kind of escaped that a little bit by being so far up north. We actually have been operating up there for two and a half years without any air conditioning. Uh, it's just so cold and dry 90% of the time that we just vent. And yeah. it's been, the plants have been super happy that way. Um, but like Southern Ontario, that, that doesn't work. That wouldn't work. Well, that's interesting because it makes me think that uh, a good place to say put a lot of these farms is in a more Northern climate, right? It just naturally lends itself to that. And that's a good thing too, because one thing we have in Canada is like a lot the, of land. All, <laughs> well, a lot of land, a lot of northern land that maybe is being yeah. underutilized in a sense because it, you can't really grow stuff there because it is so cold. Mm -hmm. and if you want to have indoors growing like that, it makes sense to do that because like we got a lot of land, especially that's not being used further north you go because almost all of Canada lives right 200 kilometers to the border, I think. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And our technology is kind of interesting that way too because like we see a lot, we're seeing a lot of major players like the, the vertical farming industry is kind of starting to tape sh take shape with some key players that are the multi-million dollar, uh, you know, funded by SoftBank and they're getting billion dollar investment and, and contracts with Walmart. So we're, we're really starting to see who the Ford and GMs are uh, of the industry, but all of those solutions are minimum three to five million dollar investment. And then some for some of these technologies. Well, a town like Capus Casing uh, that doesn't work. A town like Timmins, you're going to be hard pressed to sell enough lettuce in Timmins to recoup your three to $5 million investment. 
You've yeah. got to basically completely monopolize the whole local production scale. So finding a solution that's more cost effective um, and works in northern climate is actually maybe something that that is like that we should be striving for. Yeah, for yeah sure. like it might uh, lower the entry cost for someone who's on a smaller scale wanting to get into it, because that mm -hmm. definitely sounds like it would be a bottleneck in a way where it's like uh, just the competition aspect, because like you mentioned, the high energy use and all that kind of stuff that you're 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 a lot of uh, overhead, a lot of money in to get your crop. Yeah, exactly. And it's a lot of risk too. like hydroponics. It's a little bit like and this is an analogy that's been said to me. I'm, I'm not inventing it. Um, you know, hydroponics is like a race, a race car. You get you get there fast, so your crop yields are, are much faster. But when there is an issue, it's like hitting a wall at 150 miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, and so the newer farmers that are not yet skilled enough to notice small issues. Uh, oh, look, this leaf is a little smaller than it used to be at this size or at this <laughs> week. Like now I've got, you know, I know at three weeks, my lettuce is supposed to be this big. And when it's only this big, I figure, oh, let's check pH, let's check fertilizer, let's change our water. The first couple of years, like our production. Oh yeah. It's been a, it's been a roller coaster. It was, yeah. It really has. It took but, us about two years. Yeah. And, but every time something like that happens, it's such a learning experience yeah. for, for us. Like it's made us better farmers, like mm -hmm. all the challenges, all the issues, you know, and I think once we started looking at it that way in a more positive light, rather than the negative, oh my God, this is awful. You know, it was like a learning, a learning experience that it's yeah been way beneficial. Yeah, and that's interesting too. It sounds like on uh, it's it's a very technical thing. Like like you said, there's um you can get big yield and you can get a quick turnaround because you can kind of uh, perfectly touch all the dials that sort of make you get the the best representation of that plant. So, mm -hmm. it, but then also the 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 caveat or the catch to that is that you know like you said, if you have one little mess up, it could totally ruin your whole crop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's not very many people who do what we do, like mm -hmm. finding staff to, you know, like that the expertise isn't there. Yeah, it's it just there, isn't, yeah. which is another issue. You know, like we, we need to be educating uh, our farmers, you know, more farmers and mm -hmm. maybe like another answer could be more small scale. You know, like, again, Kapiskasing gets a farm, you know, Sudbury gets a farm, it feeds Sudbury, like, do you need these ginormous farms that feed, you know, mm -hmm. like, that's what I mean, like the bigger businesses, the bigger companies that are getting involved in this, it's like, they can't even really feed all of Toronto. <laughs> like the need yeah. is so great. Yeah. You know, like everybody needs to eat. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's, that's one thing that I kind of like to see is, uh, some something like that that would be uh more spread out like i like i think the idea of having like one huge mega farm that's centralized that tries to provide for everybody doesn't work as well and i mean no, no. i can think of a time in history where they tried to centralize farms and they starved all kinds of people right and so mm -hmm. it's it's like you think you have the the technology and the expertise but when you're managing at that scale you can't help but miss things because like you said mm -hmm. it's one little thing that you miss on a back corner and say mm -hmm. on, on, your, on, because your scale is smaller, like you're losing a lot for you, but mm -hmm. multiply that by a thousand or a hundred in a larger scale farm and yeah. you have way more loss, right? Mm -hmm. So it does make sense to sort of spread it out because you're actually spreading out your risk. And as well as that, you're making more opportunity for more jobs, especially in small communities. And in a place Got like it. Canada, we well, have and fresh food. Places. Yeah, mm -hmm. fresh food in satellite communities, especially in the yeah. North where you're limited at your access to sort of high nutrition food. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And everything that's coming in, especially in the winter time is arriving frozen. Mm. You know, that, that was a big problem uh, up North. I, I was talked to my produce managers and that's what they'd be complaining about. I actually had one of them uh, text me a picture of a, uh, like a thermometer beside his romaine. It was minus four. <laughs> like, oh, wow. that, that's what's happening to the Northern communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like, I, I, I like to hear that because I, I like to see that there's uh, benefits actually to living in a place that typically you would think of as being restrictive. It's like, actually, we got something that's good here. And it would be good to see more people doing what you guys are doing in that way. Because having those fresh greens all year round, that's one of the limitations we have. It's like, 
basically if you, like say with what we're trying to do we're gardening sort of in a more traditional way yeah. and we're going to try to basically grow as much as we can and then store a bunch right mm -hmm. and that's great and it works but it's also not fresh nutrients like the fresh fresh stuff like for example those microgreens you guys are growing mm -hmm. like that's like right now mm -hmm. you got like high value high nutrition food mm -hmm. right now. yeah and especially yeah. living in a nor northern climate you know we're you're really taxed with your your well just the environment right it's cold mm -hmm. up here and that takes a lot out of you like i know you spend a whole day outside on a cold day you get home and that's it you're you're sleeping at seven o'clock yeah, yeah exactly it's um northern communities and northern canada in general too is that we suffer from the fact that we have small populations scattered throughout thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers and so large-scale farming falters because when you get that head of romaine the head of romaine actually from california really costs pennies right it costs them pennies to generate their labor is really cheap um, they've got mega efficiencies at industrial scale a bulk of it is actually transport transporting it and the fact that they know they're going to lose a huge portion of that crop to transportation waste and so as small scale farmers, even what you guys are doing, um, we just need to strength, strengthen and support localized farming economies mm -hmm. so that it's not just and hydroponic is one part of it. But I've said it from like we farm traditionally in the summertime for our own usage. You know, what I mean, we support other local farmers um, that are farming traditionally. And I think it's a matter of just promoting that style of lifestyle. Yeah. That, to people so that they take it up. Farming is not sexy enough, apparently, anymore, which is unfortunate, but we need to really recapture people's imagination about what's possible. Well, and a lot of the farmers that are farming still are super, not super old, sorry, they're, they're elderly, you know, and, and a lot of their kids don't want to take over the farm because, you know, they realize what type of hard work it is, you know, and sometimes the rewards are great. And then, like we were saying, sometimes they're just not. You know, so it poses a whole other challenge. Like, like we were, we heard a, a story from one of our colleagues, and um, there's a company in a in a European country who invested like uh, 17 million dollars in these modular farms, and they have no one to run them because there's not enough expertise. You know, nobody really knows how to do. Not not too many people know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, the education aspect of it needs to be heavily invested in, I think. Well, that's one thing we've been talking about a lot, especially because <clears throat> part of the reason we started this podcast is to sort of outreach or, or give a place for people like you to talk about your business and how it sort of works and why you got into it, the value of doing it, because we believe that more local food economies makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. Especially, especially when you're considering the amount of energy and the amount of waste you're getting by having it local, centralized somewhere. Like, for example, in the California example for getting lettuce, they're, mm -hmm. they're building into their, build, their, their business expense, rather, that they're going to lose a certain amount of crop. And so you think all of the energy that goes into making this food and it's going to be thrown out. And then you go to yeah. a lot of these, these grocery stores that are big grocery stores, and the necessity is, is that they're going to throw out a bunch of food because they need to have the, the shelves full. Yeah. If you go to a grocery store and the shelves aren't totally full, you start thinking, oh, something's wrong because we live in this sort of false abundance in a way, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah. It's a more realistic sort of um, uh, relationship with your food and what happens because when you get those more small scale farmers, you have way less waste and all the stuff that is sort of waste, you repurpose and you put it back into the system, right? You figure yeah. out uh, to utilize your waste more efficiently. And then we donate, we donate our waste to a volunteer organization in Sudbury called Busy Bees. And uh, they cook meals for the homeless, uh, homeless population deliver, I think, like four times a week mm -hmm. up to now, you know, so waste. You know, and, is it? and that's, I guess, the benefit, again, of being in your local food economy, because for me, like, I know that there's people within my reach, like the big farmer from California. He's not going to reach out to Busy Bee and Sabri to talk about the ways that they're having the grocery stores. They're not going to do that because they're a mega corporation. Loblaw doesn't really care that much about it, right? They're not going to call individual little um, nonprofits to make sure that the waste is getting disposed of in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's important, I think, to to kind of be entrenched in your local. Food it's a economy. food community, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and, and the consumer so plays no, sorry. people involved. You know. well, the consumer plays in that too, like going to the farm farmers markets and having a direct relationship with our consumers. Hey, 
my lettuce has a little bit of tip burn this week. Oh, no problem. You know, I mean, oh, I, I had a, an issue with my lettuce mix this week. I, I only had 50 pounds instead of 100. I'm sold out. Do you want to try something else? There's less of a, there's more of a face to face where I think consumers are a little bit more accepting of issues and errors because as a farmer, and I'm really responsible, like it's tough. You see a small speck of tip burn and you're like, oh my God, that I can't sell that. I can't sell that to retail. And you're like, well, why can't I? Like, yeah. does the consumer really expect perfection? And, and some do, but you would hope that customers that have been buying from you for a number of years, they know that even there's there's a little bit of speck of tip burn on that lettuce, that there's the 99% of it <laughs> is still good. It still tastes good. You just snip it off. Whereas, you know, in grocery stores, it's like, I want the perfect tomato. I want the perfect apples. Yeah. And that's, that's where I see maybe there's a good opportunity in the smaller sort of satellite communities all in Canada is because I think when you live in a smaller community, you are by nature, like more connected to your community. Like I'm from a, a very small community further north in, in Ontario here. And when you go to the gas station, you know, everybody that works there, like, you know, you see that woman there, it's like, oh, I went to school with her kid. Like she knows mm -hmm. my first name. She knows my parents, you know, mm -hmm. I played hockey with her kids. So there's a relationship there. And like you said, you're going to have a relationship with this person who's producing your food and you're going to say, well, there's a little bit of tip burn. And it's like, well, because I talk to this farmer all the time, I know that that's no big deal. And I've, I've had the lettuce. So there's no need to throw out this perfectly good food. Yeah. You, know, mm -hmm. you, you have a more realistic expectation with your food. Yeah. And yeah. it's mm -hmm. like, even when you live in a more isolated community and you say you're a hunter and you, when you go and you harvest that animal, you, you know, what goes into getting the meat of that animal. It's mm -hmm. not, meat is not, you go to the store and you get a steak meat is a living animal right yeah exactly animal, you have to take that animal's life and you know and so when you do it like on a, as a hunter i think if you're an ethical hunter you do it with respect for the animal the life of that animal you try to put that animal out of uh like don't give it any misery you put it out quick and then mm. you harvest it you treat it with respect and then you really value that meat that's in your freezer because you put a lot of work into it that's and right something very similar to that is when you buy meat from a local farmer too you know what goes into it because you know that farmer like you, we all the farmers we talk to like they're working a regular full-time job and then on top of that they're busting their hump at the farm to provide this beautiful meat for us mm, and yeah. treating these animals with dignity and respect and like it's it's the best case scenario when it comes to eating meat ethically right mm -hmm. that's yeah, one of the big sure. things that you hear a lot of days is there's a lot of criticism with sort of um meat or, or sort of animal husbandry with what mm -hmm. it sort of has a, as effects on the environment or mm -hmm. is it ethical or any of this kind of stuff. But when you, when you have smaller scales and you're, and you're working with the sort of farmer, the food producer, you eliminate a lot of that. Mm -hmm. It makes it a lot more ethical. You have way less waste. And because you're not shipping it all over the world, you're not burning all of this, this fossil fuel that you don't need to burn. Like, you know, exactly for you guys doing what you're doing, you're supplying tons of food to this local area and you're not using giant shipping containers or, transport mm -hmm. trucks or none of that kind of stuff and providing a high quality product earning an honest day's living and mm -hmm. like it's to me it's 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 the obvious choice right. and like, like you said about how do we how do we sort of not make farming sexy in a way but like how do we like to me that's that's a that's a home run out of the park like I get that I buy into it but I'm also I buy into it. I'm preaching yeah. to the converted here right mm -hmm. so I wonder if like maybe getting involved, um, maybe say like a school level and saying like, hey, you know, um, farming actually isn't boring. If you want to learn about science, here's chemistry, here's biology, mm -hmm. here's like, you know, this is this is actually a very technical expertise need. Like we need engineering types mm -hmm. basically to do to do this kind of thing, because when you're talking about um, the limitations of pumping the water up the wall and having it drain down. Mm -hmm that's that's all engineering there too right mm -hmm. so it's it's actually a very technical thing and there's a lot of stuff to do in there and i wonder if like sort of trying to catch the wave of the promotion of stem in schools right now anyways if we could kind of divert that into also local economies and i wonder yeah. if was, like through community outreach programs and stuff like that we can sort of show kids like hey do you want to be like uh, an important member of your community well guess what you could grow food and food, mm -hmm. everyone needs food so we we really well, how, need about, how about lobbying the government to introduce a full farming curriculum how to grow mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i mean 
I, I also think, and, and this is not just us, and in some ways we're a little bit luckier than, than traditional farmers, is that we get to establish and develop our market and customer base throughout the year. So being a consistent production, like I've got my same customers week in and week out, and demand changes and shifts throughout the months, uh, of course. Um, but we are much better off than a farmer that does outside farming that wants to scale out a little bit more than just at farm gate sales or farmers markets. They have a harder time because they need to establish a customer base for three or four months and then they lose that customer base. The issue, I think, and, and we've, we're friends with a lot of traditional farmers, uh, hydroponic farmers, and they, we all have the same issue. If you're competing with the Toronto Food Depot, um, and we're only four hours away from the Toronto Food Depot, quick jump and a hop from a, for a transport truck, it's, you're, we're going to struggle. Mm -hmm. And until our local government and, and our local population start saying, hey, if I can buy this product from someone in Sudbury, I should not be allowed to buy from California. Mm -hmm. Service yeah. farming communities in, in, Your our, community in our communities first, first. Yeah. blah, blahs. If, I, if they can be serviced entirely for their local needs, farmers. maybe for three months out of the year, for all their local needs, they should not be buying and importing food. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that to me would give a huge financial investment because it's not just the growing, unfortunately. Sales. It's the sales too, right? And there's nothing that is more irritating and frightening sometimes than growing a beautiful crop that is being donated just because. <laughs> you don't have a market for it in that that week demand crashed that week all oh, the grocery stores were dead nobody your usual four cases of this that you're selling it's like oh we're good this week yeah. um the it's consistency tough. it's tough yeah and so until we stop you know when we get to a point where we stop competing with with america and brazil and mexico for our food imports then maybe more people can make a go of it because it'll be more financially luc lucrative for farmers. Like you can't expect more people to get into farming if farming is still a, you're never going to really be able to afford a, a nice vacation. Well, Jordan just said like most farmers have a full-time job mm -hmm. and then go and farm, mm -hmm. you know, like, is that sustainable? Is that, is that going to want people to get into it? Yeah. Like Farming you know? should be, and it's tough, and it's a lot of work, and people want to work, and their people are tough. They, it's not a matter of not having the know-how or the desire, but farming is still a scrape by sort of a, uh, sort of an enterprise. And traditional farmers, it's like farm your land, and hopefully in twenty years you can sell your farm and have enough to retire on. That's the wrong model, mm -hmm. right? We shouldn't be struggling for twenty years and making by. We should be able to thrive and make as much as anybody else. Like farmers, by default, I think should be an eighty thousand to a hundred thousand dollar a year career. Yeah. Um, but it's unfortunately not. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, how do you? Mm -hmm. That that makes me think too. Like when you want to talk about really investing in the community, that that to me also makes so much sense. Where it's like every dollar that's made in the community immediately leaves the community when you go to a giant store, right? It goes to some giant corporation and then because they're in all these different places, they can take all these expenses that a normal small scale can, and they just basically choke out the competition by being That's so right. big. But yeah. they get yeah. on providing an inferior product, basically, than what you're gonna get locally. And yeah, then sprayed doing with all pesticides. Kinds of Sorry? <laughs> sprayed with pesticides. Exactly, yeah. and you wanna talk about why people are unhealthy. It's like, well, let's start at the beginning. What makes up yeah. your body? What is the building blocks of your body? And it's like, yeah. it's the food you put in. We all know this, right? Yeah. But we food never is medicine. Think, exactly. Well, we never think like, you know, all right, if I put in bad building blocks, am I going to have a bad structure? Well, of yeah. course you will. Exactly. But if you put in good building blocks, you're going to have a good structure, right? Yeah. And it, it, it to me too, like if, if we have someone that's in the community, they go and earn their money, their hard earned money, and they go and give it to someone else in the community who's going to turn around and buy something off someone else in the community. We'll have that same dollar touch four, five, six, ten 10 different hands, stay in the community for a few weeks, and then it can leave eventually. But mm -hmm. everyone in the community gets to touch that same dollar. It's a sort of more circular kind of community. Well, what, a, what a strong community. Well, mm -hmm. exactly. That's you know? exactly what it is. Right. And, yeah. and then you can have smaller communities. Cause I mean, by, by definition, communities are like a contained thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not things that totally open up into the whole wide world. I mean, we are connected like that, 
but it's like we live in a place, right? We don't live in the whole world. We live mm -hmm. here in Sudbury. So we need a connected community in Sudbury where we're invested in the say sense that the money that I earn, I give to guys like you because you're feeding me, right? And mm -hmm. then, you know, you guys turn that around and make more food to feed more people. And yeah. we're, we're kind of, it's, 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 it's not like, uh, it's, it's really investing in the community in a way we don't think about it. It's like you take your hard-earned money and you put it into the people in the community. That's how we build a good yeah. community. You don't yeah. give it to the government and then ask the government to give it back to you. Yeah. Well, exactly. What the government should do is help us keep do the that. money in the community instead That's of right. helping us send our money out of the community. But I imagine there's people with lots of money who ask them very nicely if they could help them with taking money out of the community. Well, exactly. I mean, our globalized food system right now is like a big giant casino, mm -hmm. right? Whereas you go in there, billions of dollars every year are leaving Canada, going directly into the pockets of corporations that are owned and not paying <laughs> taxes in Canada. They're owned and by foreign entities. And so it's all about shareholder profits. They don't care how you feel after you eat their lettuce. They don't care that they haven't paid sub living substandard wages to their employees that are most likely immigrants. They don't care that they spray pesticides. They don't yeah. hire your local people, right? So they're not the ones hiring your neighbors. So it's unfortunate and, and it's a system like it's, it's a daunting task to look at. It's a huge mountain that we're kind of standing at the foothills because I don't think in my lifetime we're going to change that mm -hmm. on that scale. But it doesn't mean that we can't raise a stink and talk about it publicly and promote more people because as a community, we're just going to get bigger and we're only going to get more people to convert to how we think. Yeah. And yeah. so it's it's not I, I don't want I don't feel defeated about no. the fact that I don't think large scale scales may not happen in our lifetime. And it may mm -hmm. this whole issues recently with the pandemic and globalization and, and food supply shortages and stuff, we realized that there is a lot of issues with the way we do things. Well, it's one of those things where something sort of disruptive happens and it actually opens up a lot of potential for opportunity. Like, yeah, it was always the case, basically, that doing something like what you guys are doing is better. It's just now more obvious than it's ever been. And it kind of mm -hmm. makes me think like, you know, strike while the iron is hot and, and really focus a lens on the negative parts of our current food practice. And yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, movement right now to sustainability. Like we're more conscious of that now, environmentally, climate-like for the yeah. government. And I think now is the perfect time to say, all right, well, if you want to take care of your environment, take care of your community and take care of the climate, local, stay local. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's not about being... Um, like cut off from the whole wide world. It's it's just making sure that these little communities are taken care of. It's like when you're when you're in an airplane, they tell you, you know, put on your mask first and then assist someone with putting their mask on. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're dying and dead, that's you're no help to anybody. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, these communities need to be taken care of so they can help other people. And then as these communities are healthy, they can take in more people and say yeah mm -hmm. hey, come on in we've got a spot for you because you know what we've got this growing farming industry where we're taking care of each other and we need exactly. you. you're an essential part and when you mm -hmm. have a person who's engaging in that kind of work where they're an essential piece not a cog in the machine where they're like hey we need you and you're a person you're a face personality and you have they're valued well exactly and then i think that's a person who's going to have a meaningful life yeah. and they're going to they're going to reflect that back into their community and it yeah. it's it's building people. You start small. You start at the bottom. You don't start way at some huge mm -hmm. thing from above and think, oh, I'm going to fix this. But as long as the structure is like 75% good, I'm good. If you start mm -hmm. at the small, you're, you're going you're gonna to maximize that. You're going to help individuals get better, which will make yeah. the community better. Yeah. With, um, with re recent developments in the, for example, in vertical farming too, it's been a little bit disheartening uh, because you are seeing companies like Plenty uh, that are valued at a billion dollars now that have contracts with Walmart. Um, and it's like hydroponics came in as a solution to a problem. And I think hydroponics is not the only solution. I don't think hydroponics should be used to grow everything. Um, I think it's one part of a larger food eco web. Mm -hmm. But hydroponics started, you know, we got into it and hydroponics again, five, six years ago was relatively still fringe. Um, and so we 
we had an opportunity and the industry has an opportunity to promote localized food production, but it's not happening because corporate America and corporate Canada, corporations in general, get their grubby little fingers in there. <laughs> and again, it's like, don't design a solution that's easy to farm and is easy and is accessible financially for a small town of 30,000, which is totally doable. We've done it. Mm-hmm. Design these mega farms that have robots climbing the wall and harvesting the lettuce 80 feet up Mm -hmm. that only requires four jobs for, uh, you know, a hundred thousand pounds of lettuce a a day. Well, that's the same problem. You're just localizing it in a non-globalized way. So it's like, we're going to have a mega farm in Canada now instead of California, but it's still a mega farm. And Mm -hmm. that, that those products is, is only going to still hire four people, but instead instead of paying millions of dollars or billions of dollars in profits to four people that are owning these shares, how about spread Small it out scale. and yeah. hire five to six people in every little town, Community. pay them well. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a rewarding job, like you were saying, and then the money stays more localized in that community. Mm-hmm. And so we're at, kind of at that point now where I'm seeing the where it's going to head and and i think for sure toronto vancouver you want these larger scale solutions there's a place for it but there's also a place for smaller scale and i'm hoping that we can develop something and that it takes hold and and really implement it across these small communities so that when the big mega farms start shipping their stuff up we'll be like no we're good you know what like you keep your your robots in toronto and you keep your robotic harvested lettuce in Toronto, Subbury's good. You yeah. know what I mean? Timmins is good. We don't need, we don't need uh, for you guys to ship your food up. Um, but we'll see. I, I'm <laughs> pessimistic in that way. I think corporate America has a lot more money to throw around. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, the government likes that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> um, with subsidies and stuff. But yeah, subsidies for us would be great <laughs> for hydro. Yeah. That'd be well, wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, giving money that uh, came from the people back to the people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That sounds like, like a we're great growing idea. food. Give us a yeah. great. <laughs> well, I mean, that that is ostensibly what the government says they are doing is taking care of people. And it's like, well, how about we actually look at what the problem is? And it's like yeah. having food local. That That's actually the problem. These big farms is like, yeah, you can you can manage a lot of stuff. And yeah, it's great. And you make a whole pile of money. But it's like, that money, that like that value you're extracting, there's a there's a cost for that. In in the sense mm-hmm. that I mean, like having a, a robot farm, there's no people in there. No, mm-hmm. people still need jobs. People mm-hmm. still need stuff to do, and it's not because people just need something to do to make money. It's that people need something to do. They need mm-hmm. a reason to get up in the morning. It's not just as simple as giving them food. You know, no, like exactly. it, it makes me think of you know, men survive not on bread alone, and it's like, you know, to me that means. He needs, he needs a reason to get up in the morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To me, I look at a, a, a problem that I, I see with our culture is with the, like depression and stuff like that. I think people are depressed because they don't, I don't think they feel like they're valuable. I think they feel mm-hmm. like they're basically something that could just go away tomorrow and who would care or notice. And that's, yeah. that's a tragic cog. thing for a person. Yeah, cog. Yeah, it's, it's tragic. Just in the machine. A low exactly. pay cog. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and it's like, it's, it's, it's a sad thing, too, that people think of farming as being like this drudgery job, this thing that sort of has no dignity. And to me, like, I, I'd like to totally invert that and be like, no, 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 these people are heroes. These people mm-hmm. are hardworking, like literally from the dirt, like awesome people. They, mm-hmm. they, and then we need more of them. And mm-hmm. I feel like yeah. promoting or sort of idolizing sort of our farmers, or our food producers in a way, maybe would sort of make it so people would want to do that. like. Mm. maybe this is how how do you do that well so what i was just thinking was like it's sort of silly but is there a way where you kind of like you know how there's like this influencer like everyone wants to be an influencer Mm -hmm. they want to like say something on tiktok Mm -hmm. or youtube and people will give them their money it's Mm -hmm. like how about like you go and do something really cool like because to me like i I feel like there's a lot of cool stuff that's in farming like it's Mm -hmm. it's very technical it has a lot of reward there is a lot of risk. It's, it's a very dynamic field. Oh and yeah. I feel, I feel it's changing the perception, like even, well, especially because you talk to older people. And if you talk to people who grew up on farms through generations, it was really, really hard work. Mm-hmm. And especially mm-hmm. since like world war two on, it became less and less profitable and the farms got bigger and bigger and bigger. So all the mid-sized farms were eaten up by the giant farms. Cause I think in the States they had like a 
post to post is what they called it or something like that. They wanted to have these farms where it's like you, you planted as much as you could in a, in a spot. And so it, it starved out all the small farms and it's like, it's been going the other way and we're sort of reaping what we've sown. And it's like, we need to, we need to go the opposite way and, and re, re heroize. No, that's not the right word. Like mm -hmm. make heroes out of our farmers again. Yeah. I, I think unfortunately, and maybe being a little bit of not a doomsday prepper or something like that, not to sound like a doomsday prepper, but I think it's going to take a, uh, a serious issue mm -hmm in our food production, um, where people are going to become heroes again, but it's not because it's a great job, but because we're Necessity. facing starvation and we're facing yeah. food shortages at unpresented scale. Yeah, the sad part though, is it has, does it have to come to that to just to, to, for something to change, yeah. you know? Corporate, well, corporate America is so entrenched in our farming mm -hmm. uh, industry that I, I think it's gonna be hard to rip that away from them. I think well, they're gonna fight yeah. tooth and nail mm -hmm. and corporate farms are going to want to keep making huge bucks, right? So yeah. it's tough. I don't know what the solution is. I, I know that for us anyways, it's just doing what we're doing and, and being at the markets as much as we can and mm -hmm. talking to people and building those relationships. And the, the other thing that we haven't really talked about too is that when we first launched, it's like you see your other market farmers and other people in the industry as competition, Right. There's a little bit. And for us anyways, because and again, maybe you're defensive a little bit. Right. Because you're like wanting to succeed and we're built into our brains that if I succeed, someone else has to fail. Maybe mm -hmm. it's that competition of zero sum game. Mm -hmm. um, and the more we've been in this, we've realized that we are actually stronger and more profitable by leaning on each other and by building our relationships with each other. And that it doesn't need to be a competition, even if we grow the same food, yeah. even if we grow the exact same crop. We're not in competition because there's not enough food between the two of us, between the 10 of us to feed to Sudbury. feed all of Sudbury. The competition is really the grocery stores, the Toronto Food Depot. Yeah. Toronto Food Depot is the competition, not your local farmer. And so the second that that clicked for us, we started networking and building relationships without fear that if we help someone else, we're hurting ourselves and our profitability and our our scope of our business and and where we've kind of edged out profits came from farming but in different ways yeah. and it came from not just offering lettuce because people don't just want to buy lettuce it's by offering other products on our farm store that is bought from you guys bought from other people you know what i mean bought from other local farmers that i think it's really uh, farmers supporting farmers a misconception really. that needs to be overcome um because i think ultimately we're all in this together mm -hmm. um yeah so yeah. i think that's kind of a neat thing that we learned mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about your farm store um so it's actually kind of a cute story but we started off just with a freezer outside between because okay. at that point we had two modular firms uh, we just put a tarp over it to kind of uh, protect it from the the elements uh, and in the summertime, we had it converted into a fridge. And in the wintertime, because we ran it even in the winter, uh, we just had a little heater in there uh, connected to an ink bird to keep it at three degrees. Uh, we put a money box in there with a little bit of change. So people would come by, grab their bag of kale and put the money in the box. Um, I think that maybe we did that for about a year and a half. Uh, and then we purchased an ice shack. And we, uh, that was like a 10 by 12, mm -hmm. maybe Eight by 12. Uh, just kind of insulated it and put in actual refrigerators, uh, but did the same thing, left a money box with a, with a change, a change box beside it. And it just ran on the honor system. Uh, and then we ended up getting a government grant uh, and built that, that um, 10 by 24, like cabin uh, from old Hickory buildings mm -hmm. out of Werner. And uh, that's what Steph's kind of talking about. We uh, bought a couple of fridges and freezers, uh, put up some shelving. And I think now we have all of our greens are in there, of course, uh, but we also represent about 14, 15 other local businesses in there. Uh, we've got beef and pork uh, from Birch Lake Abattoir. Uh, honey comes from uh, French River. Um, maple syrup products from Maple Acres and Iron Bridge. Uh, mm -hmm. We carry mushroom products from the Ugly Barn Farm. Uh, we even have pizzas in there from a, a local pizzeria called Pizzeria Roma. 
um, and people love it. Like we, they, they love it. You yeah. know, we've really built a customer base just here at the farm. Uh, it's completely self-serve. Um, so I don't have to have anybody, you know, pay anybody to sit in there. Mm-hmm. I stock it, you know, once in the morning, once at night. Uh, and it's been wonderful. Mm-hmm. I wish we would have done that from the very beginning. But. Well, and uh, it's also then now, like, I think some of our people that were selling their products in our farm store, they see how much product we're going through and we're slowly enticing them to do the, do same, the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so our five-year strategy is to have these mini grocery stores that are all self-serve that there is one in Mark's Day, there is one on Manitoulin and it's all like you, local product. And we all meet at the farmer's markets on Saturdays anyways. And so, and so the distribution network is a localized distribution network. So everybody on Saturday, I'm bringing 20 pounds for you. I'm bringing 20 pounds for you. I'm bringing 20 pounds for you. We all make a, a wholesale retail markup on all of our products, but we're all selling so much more and it doesn't have to be full retail packaging. Right. You don't have to have the big shiny clamshell with the sticker and all that stuff because it's a farm store. And so, yeah, it's been kind of a huge success story for us. It's one of the ways that we've pivoted in the last couple of years that I think is really working out for us. And we're excited because we've just launched that farm store maybe six, eight months ago, and we're already exceeding by double what we anticipated in daily sales like it's only getting bigger and bigger where we're like oh my god we might actually need to upgrade and get a bigger one now <laughs> like we don't know what we're gonna do well, but it it's makes beautiful. Me, yeah it makes me think of just like uh, even in the city how you have your corner stores That's and you right. go and you get all the like instead of going and getting a bag of chips and a pop like having that kind of thing even yeah, in the city right. would be really great right we're like you know I'm going to go and get some lettuce and uh, a pizza for dinner, you know, instead of yeah. what there yeah. is. You know? yeah. And that makes me think too, of when we were talking to Sudbury market, we talked about the idea of like, uh, so one of the sort of barriers to entry for say hitting a wider market is, this, is that people that don't have a lot of money are going to go to the big stores because I mean, they can produce that food at basically a loss. Right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so it's, you can't compete with those people. So it would make sense. Like, all right, if we're going to give money to people, from a government level, say, it's like, how about, you know, we'll give you a certain amount of money where you can go and give that to a local farmer, right? And so mm-hmm. you're giving someone a much higher quality food like and a you're supporting a local cost. farm, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, that's that's a clear win there, right? Yeah. Because one of the things that you're actually always dealing with with a person that's, say, in a low income is, yeah, you're getting food, but it's not high quality food. Mm-hmm. No, You're not going to yeah. thrive if you're eating substandard food. And mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's one of those things we've sort of tricked ourselves into believing, or maybe been tricked into believing is that, you know, Oh, this head of lettuce and this head of lettuce are the same thing. And it's like, no, they're not even close to the same thing. Mm -hmm. One is basically water and one is full of nutrients that are going to build up your body, help your brain. And, you know, if you're a healthy, uh, healthy, happy person, you're more likely to go out into the world and succeed. Mm -hmm. That's right. And yeah. it's beautiful hearing too that you have basically an honor system and people come in there and yeah they, they have yeah. honor. Like it's 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 a refreshing thing and to hear about humanity. Cause it, it's even like I heard, I think someone say one time about like eBay. Like the idea should be is like you send me a check that bounces and I send you a box full of crap. What actually happened is you they sent the thing you wanted, they got their money, it was all happy. You guys yeah. sent the store with beautiful food. People come in there and said, okay, it's five bucks. Fine. Here's five bucks or here's whatever. And I'll take my change. And that's, that's yeah, really it's, because... it's been wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And the community love it. And, you know, I I'm meeting new customers daily mm-hmm. where it's like, my sister told me about this or my aunt comes here all the time. You know, people are actually, and we're about a 15 minute drive outside of Sudbury. They're driving here just to come to the store. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I mean, I feel wonderful because I'm helping other businesses. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm not just, it's like, if we thrive, they thrive, you know, Mm -hmm. like we're stronger together, Mm -hmm. you know? And and I think that's something too, like Steph was saying that the whole competition feeling, there's so much room. (laughs) There is so much room Mm -hmm. for Canadians to feed Canadians. You know, it it just, it blows my mind that there's farms down, down South that grow like probably billions of cucumbers and they all get shipped to the, the states. states it's insane like i, I don't get it i, I don't understand mm-hmm. you know yeah 
The yeah. farm school too, for us, I, I was a little bit anxious about that, the honor system, because I mean, we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. But what it's given us too, because the first year we launched before we had the freezer, we were here and it was like, Ray, come knock on our door and we'll yeah. sell you some kale. And that was quickly turned into kind of a headache. Oh, because you can't you can't even go get Indy from school. You've got two cars waiting for you, or they call. We drove all the way from the South End, and and nobody's home. Yeah, we had a driveway bell. It was like Tim Hortons, or like we should have been on gone. roller skates or something. Yeah, you know, exactly. we'd run out. What can I get you? Oh, a bag of kale. I'll be right back. You know. Um, yeah. So being free of that, and yeah. we still we're still around ninety percent of the time, but not being tied to the farm has been really nice and. Sometimes we get ladies or, or gentlemen that call and they're like, oh, I didn't, I, I'm, I'm missing to a toonie. Uh, I'll give it to you next time, you know, and we're like, yeah, no problem. But people are super honest yeah. about it. And, um, you know, it's been nothing but positive. Yeah, yeah, it's been it, wonderful. It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's a lovely thing to hear because it's like, you know, we really are capable of that. Like as people, mm -hmm. like, you know, we've got our flaws. We certainly do but we're capable of being good and being bigger than what we are and being a part of that community and, and conducting yourself with honor and dignity. Right. Cause mm -hmm. especially nowadays when, when say inflation with the dollar, you're losing buying power all the time. People yeah. know that that five bucks, that five bucks is a lot more valuable sort of in a sense than it was before. Right. Like you got to kind of pinch your pennies. Right. And Absolutely. So how would you think like, you know, Oh, I'm just going to steal a little bit from these guys. Right. It's like, well, no, mm -hmm. cause you know what that costs. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you can't do that to somebody because you think, well, I want that done to me. Of course not. Yeah, no, exactly. And we're people, not Loblaws. Right. I think yeah. that's the other thing, too, is that most of our customers, we we have interactions with them. They know who they're stealing from if they were to steal from us. And I think that the big part of it is like, why would you want to do that to your neighbor? Mm -hmm. Right. Why would you want to do that to people that you interact with and, and deal with every day? Yeah. So, but I mean, if you really need a bag of lettuce call us take it yeah call yeah. us i yeah. will give you a bag of lettuce and a steak if you're yeah. you know that that hungry mm -hmm. but the valley's been uh super supportive mm -hmm. of us yeah yeah and that's 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 a to me that's exactly the what i want to hear that's exactly why i believe in in trying to reach out to these communities and that's exactly why i want to find a way to 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 encourage more of this because that to me is uh it's like a perfect little little warm hub of like good yeah that's it emotion. and that's what we call it we call and it a it local radiates, food yeah. hub yeah mm -hmm. and, it, and it radiates out and it just it, it it's it's all of the good things of what we're capable of being happening right there yeah and it's it's a it's a wonderful it's gift for, isn't it? for you guys <laughs> to tell us all about that and and that in mind we're we're sort of at our time here now so would you be able to tell people where they could get a hold of your fine food and uh, how they could contact you guys? Sure. Um, we're available in some grocery stores uh, from Hearst, uh, Brian's Independent, uh, Larrabee's Independent Capus Casing. Uh, we're selling at Chris's Independent, um, here, Pockets, Terry's, uh, the Metro here in Valcaran. Uh, DNA Fine Meats also carries our products. Uh, we sell at the farmer's market every Saturday from 10 to 2. Uh, the farmer's market right now is being held at Science North, uh, but we're going to be moving outside to uh, a, an outdoor uh, location. We're not sure yet where. Uh, we're still working on that uh, for Saturdays and Thursdays uh, coming shortly. Uh, there's a new farmer's market opening up at KD Farm a couple doors down from us. Uh, that's going to be on Sundays um, from 10 to 3, I believe. So we're going to do that occasionally. Uh, and we at the, uh, at the farm store, of course, uh, which is located in Blizzard Valley. Uh, yeah. And that's 3369 Regional Road 15. Uh, and it's a great, actually, road for farms. There's quite a few farms on this road uh, that have roadside stands, too, mm -hmm. in, uh, in the season, uh, which is great. And online too, uh, mm. oh, via right. order fresh, so orderfresh.ca, which is our uh, home, delivery. home delivery service. And there's a whole bunch of products there too. So it's not just our leafy greens. Um, yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. Have a great day. You too.